All right, so this is going to be a, a weekly thing we're going to try and do. I'm Sean. Hi there, I'm Scott. And uh, we're going to talk uh, basically about cloud and and what's going on in the world of Azure and AWS. And and we're going to talk a little bit about the courses we've created. And, uh, and we're going to just see how it goes. So, hey, Scott, it's very early for you. Hey, Sean. Yeah, it's getting late. We're, we're trying to do this. Thing around the world it's gonna be uh, it's interesting start yeah and it's getting getting colder here and you're about to get into the hot season so it's like uh, opposites yeah. in many ways yeah so just so everybody knows what we're, we're talking about I'm in Sydney Australia and Scott's in Toronto in Canada so um, mm -hmm. yeah it's time zones are a little bit challenging for this stuff so it's like um, 11 o'clock here and it's what seven in the morning there yep and um, and the only reason I know what time it is there is because I'm originally from there. So that's the only reason. Other than that, if it wasn't for the iPhone and that, I wouldn't have a clue. So, um, so what we kind of want to do with these is we'll we're going to talk, like I said, about some of the things that are going on in the industry in general. Um, we might get some questions from students and things through the various Udemy courses and stuff that we do. Have some some opportunity to talk about those. And uh, and we'll also talk about maybe some updates that have happened in courses you've got, the ones we're working on together, and uh, just give everybody a bit of an update. So if you've got questions or anything, feel free to throw them through. Um, we'll start off, I think, with our with a shout out to one of our five star reviews, Vivek yeah. Tiwari. Thank you very much, Vivek, for, uh, for giving us our first five star review on our new AWS Solution Architect associate course so that's pretty cool yeah that's awesome thanks for Vic and um, maybe we'll kick off with that right so we released the course this week yeah yeah it's only been uh, I guess five days now so could go us but um, I've been very very happy with it it's uh, it was a lot of work that we put into it and now it's live on the marketplace uh, udemy.com slash AWS hyphen architect Go check it out. Yeah, so uh, I think it's one of those things, right? Like um, you work in, so I mean, you you predominantly deal with like Azure, right? Like, and, and yeah, and I spend a lot of time on all the sort of public clouds, and you kind of know, you know, a lot of the details, and you know, a lot of the even the superficial high level stuff, but when you're putting together a course and you got to go into some of the detail man there's um there's a fair bit of research that has to go into that yeah it's always been interesting that um of course the certification the the vendors that put together these certifications they want to test a broad range of all of the features and so it's typical we'd be working within our our, our companies and our employers that we're only working on 30 percent of that at any particular time um, so to, to sort of stretch out our knowledge, I mean, as students, it's a challenge to, to go cover things that you haven't necessarily worked with. Uh, but as a, as an instructor, it's, a cha it's a challenge to teach, uh, everything into such a degree. And of course, everyone's got different experiences. Some people come, come in with very deep knowledge on virtual machines, but haven't touched a lot of the, um, other features of AWS or and as of Azure, so it's uh, challenges for for both instructor and student, but definitely definitely worth it. And it brings you it, it's how you grow, um, you know, for everyone. It was interesting. So on Friday, I had a client meeting with work, and um, uh, the client was talking about um, importing real time data. And uh, because I had just recently done the section on Kinesis, right? Um, I instantly could just trot out this, oh, well, are you going to use fire hose or are you going to use shards? And I was like, I got all excited about it and stuff. I was really yeah. like pumped up to talk about it. And the guy just looked at me, he's, he was an enterprise architect at a, a large sort of retirement fund here in Australia. And he just said, Dude, I got no idea, man. That's what I have people for. So it's you know, <laughs> like, oh well, but I wanted to tell you all about it. So uh, yeah, so it was fun. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you'll find that in whether you're interviewing for jobs or talking to people, having this, this knowledge to uh, pull out is uh, always handy. So that's why it's important not to live in our little worlds and just sort of try to expand ourselves a little bit, you know? Well, the thing is, is when you, st when you do work in the environments, right? Like, uh, I'd say a large portion, I, I heard a stat from somebody who's, um, who was an AWS employee, a senior executive in Asia Pacific. And he pointed out that about 70% of all the revenue that Amazon earn on AWS comes from EC2. Okay. So, and, and uh, apocryphally, when you deal with clients, they often are talking about S3 and they're talking about EC2 and right. all, and all the other stuff. Yeah. There's a little bit of Lambda that floats around. There's, you know, um, there's some el elastic cache occasionally, but mostly it's the two big ones. Of course, the cloud platforms want you to use uh, more and more of their stuff. They want you on CloudFront. They want you on um, the RDS and the uh, SQL Server databases and things like that because that's more locking for them. That's that's what makes it harder for you to use a multi multi um, vendor strategy, multi cloud strategy. So um, there's there's some business interest for for them for you to to um, use more but um yeah i mean that's the reality is we all have systems and hosted environments and you just lift it's like lift and ship right you get the vm from your local server and you run the vm over here and whew, done i've just migrated to cloud yes <laughs> yeah well it's it, it's amazing how there's a uh when you talk to solution architects. So, so if we think about the strata, the, the strata, you've got your enterprise architects and then down maybe a little bit, you've got solution architect. You talk to the, even at that level and they have no comprehension of some of the complexities about migrating to cloud um, or they treat it like basically um, I refer to it as VMs in the sky. It's just yeah. somebody else has some tin that you put them on and, and they're not really thinking about some of the underlying uh, underlying issues that are associated with moving stuff, right? Like you can't just shunt a VM into AWS or Azure. You got to actually, there's a, there's actually a migration process and do you want to reinstall that stuff? So there's a fair bit that goes on. And, and um, I think the big vendors talk a fair bit about, Oh, it's easy, but it's not that easy. Uh, I've done yeah. thousands and thousands of migration VMs and it's, it's not that easy, but interestingly, you released a course this week also because you're very prolific and you, <laughs> and you work exceptionally hard. Um, you released a course on serverless. Right. For sure. So, you know, I mean, serverless has been a buzzword for the last, I would say, couple, couple of years. Um, both both uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure have come out with uh, serverless features. And if you don't know what serverless features are, um, when we're talking about moving stuff into virtual machines, there is this benefit of running things in the cloud and being able to um, spin up a virtual machine very quickly and spin it down when you don't need it. But it's still a uh, operating system. It's still a machine. Um, you still SSH into it or use remote desktop. In the serverless world, you really don't have access to the underlying machine and the vendor will take care of scaling and backups and recovery and those types of things. And so um, it's a total, it's sort of a, they call it a paradigm shift. I hate that, that term, but uh, it's like a different approach to, um, uh, to designing applications. And so, and then in, in the, they call also call it microservices, which are these smaller bits that you can uh, deploy um, if you need a, a login service over here and you need a authentication service, you need this and you need that, and it's just like different services. So this is a, I did a course for Microsoft Azure because Azure has what's called logic apps and functions. I know that in AWS, it's uh, uh, Lambda and uh, step functions it's called. So it's all, it's all very, uh, very similar across the different platforms, but um, it's, it's yeah, it's fascinating, right? Like, go back in time ten years, and we were talking about service-oriented architecture, right? That's what. Just, yeah. And and if you think about what microservices are, they're kind of like 
infrastructure free service oriented architecture and um it, it, it things don't things don't change they just kind of go away and come back 10 years or every 10 years so um it's interesting though uh, what's your thought around serverless from the perspective that okay i'm i'm joe the developer my company wants to create a next generation application um, they want it on cloud because we don't want to have any infrastructure on premise um, i decide to use the azure uh, logic apps paradigm um, am i not locked into that platform now oh absolutely um, if you start creating um, functions and apps yeah those do not Mine, you can't decide, oh, you know what, I want to run that on, on Rackspace now, or I want to run that on, on IBM Cloud or something like that. So, yeah, that's another, another way that the vendors want you to, um, to be locked in is to use it. But the, what they're trying to sell you on is the benefits of, like I said, they've taken away a lot of these responsibilities, the traditional responsibilities of operations in terms of monitoring CPU utilization and um, whether you use a script or whether you manually scale, um, they're, they're switching to a pay per consumption model as opposed to have an hourly rental of this virtual machine. Uh, so if you have applications that are small, let's say you have a, a, a financial application that only runs during month end, but when it runs, it needs a lot of resources um, you know you're paying for the consumption the number of transactions the number of CPU cycles not paying for uh, $1,500 a month to rent that server that only use is used two two times a month right so they're they're trying to sell you th this is the carrot but yes there's a little bit of um, a price to pay right yeah it's um, I mean it is the cloud elasticity dream right I mean, that, that's yeah. when cloud, when people think of that, they think, oh, I'll use it when I don't, or I'll use it, you know, um, I'll use it sometimes and sometimes I won't. It's interesting. We'll talk a bit, a bit about it later, but um, Microsoft released their version of reserved instances, which is almost the antithesis of, uh, of this serverless idea, right? It's like buying servers from them and paying over time. So it's quite, yeah. it's quite, it's quite fascinating. Uh, we, uh, I've dealt with a, a company here in Australia who are what I would, so if I would consider them like a third generation cloud consumer. So they did the IaaS stuff, uh, you know, nearly 10 years ago now. They then switched to a little bit more of a DevOps focus uh, probably about four or five years ago. And now they're doing containerization. So they're using Docker containers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and their view of the world is we want to be cloud agnostic. So our right. doc, our Docker container can exist anywhere. And so then they start using for used the burstable example, right? They envision a scenario where they effectively go to spot markets and buy yeah. compute as and when they need it. Um, and then move their container there, which is really, I mean, that's, that's next generation stuff. That's advanced, yeah. And that's the thing is you end up, with, like we said, with the, the, the pros and cons of serverless is then you have to worry about that stuff. You have to spin up when you need. You have to spin down. Um, I know that Amazon moved to a per second billing model a couple of months ago, whereas, you know, AWS has, or, I mean, Azure has a per minute billing model and it used to be per hour. And like they're coming, they're competing on these, um, micro levels um, so the market has to sort of move in like almost two directions at once like you can't you can't fit everyone as a serverless and you can't fit everyone into fully managed spin it up spin it down uh, either like there has to be this this option this choices and um, so yeah it's uh, it's very interesting and, and it keeps our jobs interesting right yeah, that's right. We'd be bored if we didn't. If it all just worked, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> there would be no place for us in the world. Um, and it never changed. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting though. I was reading um, last week about Azure, and they made a subtle change 
to that in response to Amazon's per second billing, they went to, they made a shift where they said, we will round to the nearest minute, but we will always round you down. So if you use a server for one minute and 58 seconds, they'll only charge you for a minute. Oh, wow. So that's, that's pretty clever, right? Like that's, right. that's, and the other thing with their reserved instance. Yeah, it cost them, doesn't cost them anything really. Uh, the compute's sitting there, right? It's, yeah. it's, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting. Except so, in Australia where they, they keep running out of VMs and I heard that UK as well is running out of VMs. Yeah. Azure. So <laughs> yeah, Microsoft, it's, it's, the market in Australia is fantastic. It's really interesting. Yeah. Sydney launch of AWS's uh, region here was their best, highest uptake launch they've ever had. And Microsoft had the exact same example here. And it was yeah. because Australian companies are very, very, very heavily virtualized. Um, Aussies Thanks are- to you. Yeah, all, all, yeah, all, all down to me. All down to you, yeah. <laughs> and, but Aussies are cheap, right? They don't want to buy hardware if they don't have to. So, yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so yeah. they virtualized pretty quickly. And so it was, they understood cloud. And so, but Microsoft has a massive, massive market for Azure here. It's very, very yeah. popular. So, um, so, yeah, so they do run out of, occasionally run out of cap, uh, capacity here. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let's move on a little bit, talk about some yeah. of the updates and changes to courses we've done. I'm going to come back to the ones that I made this week. Did you, what, what have you done this week on your Azure courses? Um, so, you know, uh, now that we've launched this AWS course, um, I have to turn back around to, um, some updates that Microsoft made. So uh, in October, Microsoft, you know, they have their annual um, Ignite conference. And um, I should know this, right? They always introduce new exam changes during Ignite. So um, they came out with changes to the 533 exam, the 532 exam, and most significantly, they've actually retired the 534 exam and are coming out with what's the 535 exam and replacement. So um, Microsoft has sort of thrown, uh, as I was uh, working on our AWS course, Microsoft threw this uh, curveball, but that's, uh, that is life. So um, yeah, coming up, I've been adding content to that course and uh, this month in November is 100% focused on um, getting new content out for those courses um, and getting them ready for, for students to, who have to deal with these changes. Um, and uh, of course, even with the AWS course that we, you and I have together, um, I've got plans to add assignments and, and add some quiz questions and things like that to really round out the course. You know, when you're learning, you can't just watch a video and you can't ever watch a, a video course and then go off and take the certification test. Like it just doesn't work like that. You need to sort of, uh, especially if you're not familiar with those topics, um, you need to get into the management console. You need to spin up VMs. You need to SSH into it. You need to set up SSH. You have to need, you need to do these things after we teach them. So um, I have a, a plan to uh, add assignments and you can check those assignments, uh, things like that. So, so I just wanted to go back. So you probably, some of your Azure students will be watching this. So mm -hmm. they're retiring 534. So yeah. what, does that well, do, what does that do for your certification accreditation? What's it like a two year grandfather scenario? Is that how it works? So um, no, Microsoft's, Microsoft's got this approach now where these, the exams themselves, um, the certification that you got with 534, it, you don't lose it, okay? So um, the 535 in this particular case is a pure replacement that they, they had this 534 and they, they have 535 and they buttress against each other. Um, whatever 534 qualified you for, you're going to be able to take 535 and qualify for that. Um, the, the real interesting bit is they're starting to add years, year numbers to the certification. So in 2018, you'll be um, Azure certified as an architect for 2018. 
right? So the, the, they'll actually have the year of your certification as part of the name of the certification. Um, that's a new that's a new change. So if you got certified five years ago, clearly, um, and you haven't done any other training or or certification tests since then, then you are um, clearly five years out of date, and that's fair. So um, all you need to do is take one exam a year, uh, any exam in Azure to maintain that certification. Um, so with 534 and 535, um, I did an analysis of the requirements of both exams side by side. I went through each of the, the topics covered. And I'm not entirely sure why they retired 534 and didn't just do what they did with the other exams, which is just um, uh, just update the existing requirements. Somehow they made that, that determination, the calculus on their side, that 535, 534 was significant enough that they needed to change the number. So um, I'm treating it like it's just a, a fight, like it's just additional requirements that were added. Nothing was really removed. So it's not like you were on 534 and you, you learned 10 things. And now five of them are not on the new exam. It's just things potentially being added. So it's, um, uh, anyways, I just have to create new content for that. And um, you got to, when you're dealing in the cloud training space, this happens, you know, the books get out of date, the tra training courses get out of date. Um, and we just have to, we have to accept it. Yeah. There's, um, re, uh, reinvent is coming in two weeks. So yeah. um, I'm sure Amazon will release 10,000 new things and we'll get slammed then too. But so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because y y those comments go back to a question we had from Naninga in the AWS uh, solution uh, architect course. Mm -hmm. he, he asked if the course would cover the, the beta exam. So Amazon have uh, their solution architect associate course. They have a 2018 beta test they're playing around with now that you can take. And uh, obviously people are asking, well, if you release a new course, is it going to cover that, that test? Well, the short answer is kind of yes, but we don't know for sure, right? Because the test is in beta, so you can't right. really confirm or deny what's in a test. Uh, I think the overarching thing you can say is that the the the, the content isn't going to change dramatically. Um, the balance of what they test for will change. So I think they're doing some work around how many questions they ask around certain topics and things. Yeah but you still need to know all this stuff. Um, yeah, that's the thing is these underlying platforms for both AWS and Azure, as they exist today, they're not gonna be significantly different on January 1 or February 1. Like if you even you go two months out in the future, there's, there's a 98% overlap between today and, and two months from today. So um, even though the test changes, the underlying subject hasn't changed from today till, so um, that's that's the same for any cloud platform. It's, um, it's not like Photoshop where 2018 could be completely different from 2017 because they released the new version. Cloud platforms change incrementally over time, and the the you know the slope is not it's steeper than more most uh, platforms, but not steep. You know what I mean? It's just gradual. It's, um, I'm going to talk about the changes I made this week because um, those were fun. Um, yeah. We, so we released the course publicly. It hit the marketplace, what, Tuesday, right? Tuesday, yeah. um, Tuesday morning, your time, sort of Tuesday evening, my time. Yeah. And um, we had a video that was, uh, that I uploaded and it worked perfectly well on my side. It worked perfectly well on Udemy side when they reviewed the course and then when it went live for some reason it lost all of its audio <laughs> <laughs> so so there was uh yeah I actually previewed it so before we launched the course I sat down and watched um you know your s3 section and so I didn't notice that there was missing audio yeah so, uh, so it wasn't there like the, the audio problem wasn't there the audio was there 
<laughs> yeah, so they they obviously re-rendered the video or something after yeah. the second time. So sometimes they do that, right? They re-render in a higher resolution or whatever, and and obviously yeah. that that killed the audio. So it was panic stations getting that one back up, and then in one of the lectures on the REST API, oh, that was good for S3. Um, I had transposed an HTTP post and a put and then on the slide. And then of course, while I'm doing the lecture, uh, I'm kind of looking at the slides as I'm going through it. And of course I've just compounded my stupidity with kind of going with the flow on the slide. So I yeah. had to, and one of our, uh, one of our, uh, one of our friendly students pointed out to yeah. me, that hey man you made a mistake yeah and, that happens and so i reshot that part of the video and and we published that one so so my two updates this week to the course were um yeah rather uh, rather embarrassing and, and not so fun but uh yeah it happens Listen, this is this is yeah this is what we do here is you know we put together this information and yeah mistakes uh, mistakes happen or other technical issues happen it's um unfortunate but that's the level that um uh, that the best that anyone can do really yeah well so i think in the next couple of weeks like you said we're going to focus on putting some sample questions together i know we had some before we launched but i don't think we had enough coverage and right. took them and took them off um so I think we'll go back and hit that in the next couple of weeks. And um, and I, I know I'm going to go through and probably in the next week or two and start doing more over-the-shoulder videos of some of the sections um, to give people a bit more of a UI feel for some of the some of the features and functionality. But so, yeah, new content coming all the time, I think, in the next yeah. week. Anyway. I mean, I know this is an architecture course, um, and architecture is about understanding – the broad concepts so that as you're putting a solution together, you know, like you, you said in, uh, you know, 20 minutes ago, you're in a conversation with somebody and you already know, Oh, I should, I should talk about this feature. Um, that's, that's sort of the essence of being a good architect is understanding everything, how everything works and why. But uh, I think it's interesting and useful for people to see, it in action it also um breaks up the monotony of looking at our ugly faces or whatever so yeah yeah <laughs> we, we try to do a good job of not showing our ugly faces that much that was uh, so mix it up yeah i think actually, that, was a, that was a good uh, course design decision to only have uh, a right. limited amount of us <laughs> <laughs> that's right i um it was interesting you mentioned about that um the solution architecture because I did the the best practices lecture. It's I think the last content lecture at the end, and I actually really enjoyed that one. It's quite long. It's a twenty minute lecture, but mm -hmm. um, it's uh, one of the things I get the pleasure of doing in my job is kind of mentoring uh, younger solution architects. So I, I kind of get to do that, yeah. and um, and so those were kind of points that were were able to be expanded on it was actually good fun i recommend anyone take the time if you got 15 20 minutes to kick around go watch that lecture it's it's um it's not uh it's best practices that you can apply to aws but it's actually even if i do say so myself it's actually a pretty good lesson for a solution architect on how to actually solution correctly and mm -hmm. and how to, and how to think about you know security first as a principle not as something you just slam into your solution at the end um failure you know designing for failure because everything fails those are those kind of concepts are good so uh, I'd, I'd recommend you watch that i guess we'll close this section out if if you've got questions ask them in the course or we yeah. have our we have our facebook group at feelingcloudy.com forward slash fb um, you can go there, join the group. It's free. Um, ask your questions there. Happy to answer them. And uh, I think every week we'll, we'll when we're doing these, we'll pull in um, we'll pull in some student questions and um, and go from there. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are a student, thank you very much. We Sean and I are both appreciative of you picking up the course. Um, the course needs your 
help and needs a review. So if you do watch the course and it does pop up and say, um, consider leaving a review, that would be very helpful to us um, and we will appreciate, you don't have to, um, we don't have to read your name on air, but we will absolutely appreciate that you've taken the time to leave a review to help other people find uh, the course. So I mean, thanks in advance for that. Absolutely. So let's talk about a little bit of news now because um, I think it's interesting stuff. Um, this week we had a couple of reasonably high profile AWS S3 leaks. So did you see the one from the US military? Yeah, I heard about that. So yeah, they, they basically, they've been, <laughs> they've been scraping social media posts um, looking for suspects or suspects or weird people who post crazy stuff on Facebook and whatever. And they've been consolidating that, those scrapes. And they've obviously been consolidating and putting it in an S3 bucket. Okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> somebody in the military didn't quite know how to secure an S3 bucket. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And so that bucket was suddenly available to everybody all around the world with uh, one point. 8 billion scraped posts. Good job. Wow. Good job. Yeah. Be all you can well, the, You know, the, the, there's a big focus on this because um, this isn't the first time that people have left S3 buckets unsecure and, and uh, hackers or uh, other others have found, you know, all a bunch of customer records. You see, you'll hear about these companies who have to publicly apologize for, exposing your customer data and that sometimes comes from just a public uh, open s3 bucket it was price waterhouse coopers had that a few weeks ago too from memory right and, yeah that's um, what i'm thinking about is the yeah pwc right yeah. and the and the other one was um very near and dear and close to my heart the australian broadcasting corporation had one this week so the abc um uh anti as it's called here um it's our government funded broadcast um, company like the CBC in Canada, or I guess in some respects the BBC in the UK, and the uh, the ABC had a whole bunch of um, video content that they'd stored in S3 buckets, and not only that, they went one step further down down the chain. They had their backups there, and so okay. e emails, logins, at least they were hashed passwords, thankfully. Um, but they were all exposed and, and it, it, it's really weird that Amazon then came out this week and said, Hey, um, they, they added a stoplight for, yeah. to, 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 to warn people, but they also said, you know, be careful with these bucket things. They're pretty powerful, but it's strange, right? Cause S3 is, uh, private by default. So some, some bozo had to go turn that on <laughs> security <laughs> off. Like, like, sorry. well, yeah, well, like you said, a lot of times security is bolted on. And so as when you're developing something, it's sometimes easier just to, um, to create it in a certain way. It's a, it's a hidden security hole, right? It's yeah. no, but nobody ever, I mean, very, well, I mean, you, sometimes you'll see a file that's linked publicly directly from S3. Maybe that's how they're finding these containers, but, um, very rarely are you as a consumer sent to a clearly labeled S3 bucket. It might have a, a customized domain to it, and so you wouldn't automatically know where it's coming from. But um, yeah, it's it's sort of a, one of those hidden things. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, thank God, I mean, they have to flag these things on your dashboard and say, you did you know this is uh, the security risk for sure? Yeah, I had, um... Actually, Amazon. To be to be fair, they're they're pretty good about stuff like that. I had one. Um, was doing some testing, uh, probably about three or four months ago, with um, Amazon Workspaces, like their desktop as a service offering. And um, to use that, you have to really set up a, di a directory service. So I had chosen the um, just the standard uh, SAM before version that you know whatever, but. I got an email from Amazon saying, Hey, did you know you left this directory up? And if you don't delete it by the end of this day, we're going to charge you like 35 bucks or something. So yeah. 
So that helped me out because I'd have paid for that happily on my credit card. Would never have seen that charge. <laughs> um, so uh, well, thanks, is, thanks, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about Azure. Sometimes I'll be creating courses, creating content, and then at, at the end of the month, I'll see a charge for a hundred dollars on my credit card, and you're like, oh, I left, the, I left that double um, web app running. It's doing nothing. It's just <laughs> yeah, the, the the app that you don't log into and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other the the last piece of news we we touched on it was Azure did the release of reserved instances. So finally, yeah, it's so I can I'm going to talk about reserved instances as a customer, right? Because I've used them fairly extensively in a previous job. Um, uh, when I was on the CIO side of the table, uh, I use them pretty heavily because our account manager from AWS called me up one day and said, Hey, did you know I can save you 40% of your monthly running cost of Amazon? And I'm like, that's really awesome. Tell me how I'm going to perform yeah. this. How's this sorcery happening? Yeah. And, uh, and he told me about reserved instances cause we had a bunch of, um, because we were kind of a 24 hour business, we just had services that ran all day, every day. And he explained what reserved instances were. This was years ago. Right. And, um, and pointed out the services they thought would work. And we did, we cut our costs by 40%. And so one day we were having lunch and I sort of asked him, um, how, what does this do to your, you know, your KPIs? And he said, uh, every time Amazon cut costs, or they cut the price, or they release a feature that lowers your bill, my targets don't change. So he just actually yeah. cops, he cops it as a, as a sales guy. He just has to sell more. And, right. and so, yeah, so reserved instances oh. are, are great, right? Like, but effectively, you have to understand what you're doing there. You're, 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 you're leasing that instance. Like, you're right. actually paying for it whether you use it or not. So, um you know, it, it's, but the, mind you, the, the cloud platforms, I think Amazon has been growing at 65% year over year. So yeah. <laughs> if you're a salesperson for Amazon, maybe you've had some good years in a row now. So, yeah, but it's interesting though, right? Like Amazon, the one, the thing that was, I was reading about the Azure reserved instances is they will give you a refund or a, a pro rata refund. So right. if, you, if you do a, a reserved instance for three years, pay for it in advance, and then year and a half in, say, hey, don't have that need anymore, they'll actually give you a, a, a pro rata Some refund. Part of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess they're banking on the fact that very few people will um, need to back out of it. Like I said, they're, they're offering the – now, the thing is, a, AWS has had this, um, like you said, for years, and the fact that Amazon uh, – Microsoft hasn't um, is a gap, and obviously AWS also has this concept of spot instances where you're bidding on on EC2, and then you could get it taken away from you if someone outbids you and things like that. Um, that's also an interesting thing that hasn't shown up within Azure yet. But um, I mean, to me, this is just a cloud platform. If you know that you can commit to two years, and a lot of big companies just have budgets and um, you get the 40%, 50%, 60% savings. That's a no brainer. Like it's uh, you know, who's going to want to pay probably by the hour when they know for sure that they're going to be still using these servers next year. Yeah. So it's actually really interesting. I, the Azure ones are saying that you can get up to a 72% saving on uh, an RI. So a reserved instance over a traditional pay as you go model. And with Azure Hybrid, it's eighty-two percent. So if you bring your own licenses, it's actually even right. even higher. Which is, I mean, I remember having a conversation with somebody in our, you know, our CFO or something, nice. and and he's just like, well, it, the math works out that with reserved instances, it was actually cheaper than buying the hardware. Like, it, wow. Normally, one of the things that is, you know, maybe as the solution architects and enterprise architects who are listening to this, there's this common concern. I'll call it a misconception that if you go public cloud, um, it is cheaper than buying hardware on premise. No, never. Um, if you run 
a, a server flat out 24 7 365 um, it's always going to cost more than if you were to buy that and run it up. But with reserved instances and right timing and right sizing, yeah, cloud does yeah. stack up financially. Um, this is the well, hybrid, the, hybrid IT conversation, right? It's happening a lot. Yeah. And, and although a lot of companies got into this multi-cloud strategy, trying to be able to say, oh, well, this time Microsoft's cheaper, but next time AWS is cheaper. And, you don't, if you don't want to be locked in, like you said, with containers, you can find out where the, where the place has spent it. But, you know, once you go reserved instance, it kind of cuts off that uh, pitting one against the other strategy. You have to pick one. And, and it, it's, um, you're just leasing at that point. You're just leasing the hardware at that stage. Yeah. It's, it's, yep. Let's just call it what it is. So, uh, but financially, it makes a lot of sense. The interesting one, the way that Amazon do theirs, is if you buy a reserved instance and you don't want it anymore, you can't get a refund. But they have a, a marketplace where you can basically sell and rent out your reserved instances. So you can try and collect some of your money back. Sure. And, Throw it uh, in the spot market. Yeah, it's a bit like a spot market, right? And uh, Airbnb. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Airbnb for reserved instances. Um, yeah. somebody's, somebody's now going to go out and create that. There's going to yeah. be an app on your phone for this right. tomorrow. Um, and, uh, a third party spot instance market. Yeah. So that's, uh, so that's an interesting thing. Um, we have a couple other news items. Uh, I think they're pretty minor around features and functionality, but uh, maybe we'll cover them another time. We've been running for nearly an hour now. So that's probably, oh, yeah. good. That's probably good enough. Yeah. Um, so how did you reckon this went? Well, you know, I, I, I love talking to you and we don't get a lot of chance because of the time zone difference to get on audio or to get on video, even rare. So, um, and then to talk about cloud stuff and AWS and Azure, um, I, I want to, you know, want to keep this going. This is, um, yeah, it's good. Let's do, let's do another hour. Yeah. So what we're going to do, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is we're going to yep. get this recording. We'll put it in the Facebook group and I think, do you want to add it to the, to the, uh, I mean, I'm happy to add it to the AWS courses an extra lecture at the end of added value stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why not? Um, I think it's, it's to get people attention that if you want to subscribe to this um, on a weekly basis, um, you know, we'll be able to, to give this to you for free for no additional costs. And hopefully there's uh, you know, you know, as, as, cloud people ourselves, there's just not enough places where you can um, get this kind of information and have these kind of discussions. So Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like there's a lot of, I mean, we could, uh, look, we have an exam certification prepare preparation course, right? That's what we kind of are selling. But I think a lot of people who are taking that course are actually trying to do this for their career. They're trying to figure yeah. out a solution for cloud and all that stuff. So that's kind of part of the conversation that one, I think we can probably add some value to people is, is we can talk about those issues, but also too, for the people who are learning uh, as a career, um, hearing some of that conversation and seeing that stuff actually helps their personal and professional development. So that, that's kind of has me a bit excited about it is we can talk yeah. about things that aren't specifically, you know, this question to pass that exam or whatever the, that is right because that gets boring you can you can read right. a book or you can watch a video course right so um so yeah so we'll do this maybe again we'll do this again next week not maybe we will do this again yeah. next week and in the interim i'm going to drop some links because that's what i do um <laughs> you can Here, go let me pick those up for you yeah uh, i drop things and you pick them up um <laughs> you can go to feelingcloudy.com forward slash FB and that will get you to our Facebook group. It's free to join, mm -hmm. let you in. Um, and then we have feelingcloudy.com forward slash AWS dash S A A. And that will take you directly to our uh, AWS course and you can get it for us 10, 10 bucks. So by being a viewer, you get a special discount because we like you. If you're not mm -hmm. already a customer, um you might be you might not be don't know yeah and do you want to drop your uh your cloud heroes page man yeah so um best place to go right now is uh, softwarearchitect.ca i haven't uh, uh set up 
I'm going to I'm going to move over to a thing called Cloud Heroes at some point. But softwarearchitect.ca is is where um, I blog, where I um, post changes on Azure and things like that. Um, we also have a group for Azure specifically. There's a Microsoft Azure user group. If you look on Facebook for that, um, we've got several thousand members and discussions are happening every day about Azure specifically. So welcome anyone who wants to, to join. You don't have to be a student even. Anyone can join the um, uh, Microsoft Azure group. What we should do is get a short link next week so that we can make it easy for people. Yeah, well, one step at a time. Baby steps, man. <laughs> Baby steps. All right, man. Well, it's been fun, and uh, yep. we'll talk again next week. Yep, thanks a lot. See ya. Bye.